So welcome to Intersectionality, Standing Up for Our Values and Ourselves. My name is Arielle Schwartz. I am APAC's National Progressive Constituency Director based out of our Boston office. No, I'm sorry, I was out of our Boston office. <laughs> now I'm in DC, so I am local. I uh, used to be a fellow at the National Center for Lesbian Rights, the National LGBTQ Task Force, and the ACLU, so this topic is uh, pretty personal. Um, and I am thrilled to be joined by our esteemed panelists today, Chloe Valgere, the Director of Theory of Enchantment, Amanda Berman, Founder and Executive Director of Zioness, and then Ty Gregory, Executive Director of A Wider Bridge. So this session will explore intersectionality, or the idea of shared or intersecting causes, which has been the basis for a, gro a growing number of alliances through, uh, though often excluding, pro-Israel and in some cases, Jewish voices. Some proud pro-Israel social entrepreneurs, like these lovely people, are questioning the application of intersectionality and leading the charge for change. So just as a reminder, we're gonna We'll probably leave about 30 minutes at the end for Q&A because we really want this to be an organic conversation and we want to uh, give you answers for your questions and things to take away with you. And also as a reminder, this session is on the record and open to the press. So we have a great deal to cover today and the conversation around intersectionality can be complicated and complex and one that is deeply passionate and rooted in identity politics. After all, the personal is political. And I could have read their bios, but I think it's a real opportunity for people to introduce themselves in an authentic way. So before we dive right in, I'm gonna ask all of them to, all of you, to provide a snapshot of your background. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Chloe Valdery. I did Israel advocacy in college and in various uh, Israel organizations subsequent to college for about eight years. And after doing Israel advocacy for eight years, I created an educational startup called Theory of Enchantment, which teaches people essentially how to get along with each other by, <laughs> by teaching them healthy psychology through the lens of pop culture. Uh, I'm Amanda, oh yeah, Chloe. <laughs> I'm Amanda Berman, and I'm super excited to sit with very close friends right now for an important conversation that we have over drinks all the time and to share it with you. Um, I'm the founder and executive director of Zioness, which is a new-ish, actually not super new anymore, uh, organization that is empowering and activating American Jews to stand proudly in progressive spaces as both Jews and Zionists, um, and trying to create a community for all of those of us, the vast majority of American Jews, who identify as both members of the political left and also so Zionists. I'm Ty Gregory. It's great to be here. Uh, for the first several years of my career, I worked for a great organization called APAC. <laughs> they have good conferences. I'd recommend you come. Um, and then I moved on to an amazing organization called A Wider Bridge. We're the pro-Israel LGBT organization, advancing equality in Israel and equality for Israel. Um, and I got into this work because it was tough having conversations about Israel and the LGBT community. And it's often harder to be a Jew in LGBT spaces than it is to be uh, LGBT in Jewish spaces. So we're trying to solve those problems. So we now know who you are, but let's talk about why we're here and let's lay the foundation for what we're talking about. I gave a very mundane uh, definition of intersectionality. So please define intersectionality for our guests and also discuss some of the challenges and or opportunities of intersectionality being the primary framework we use to conceptualize progressive organizing. Yeah, and feel free to chime in. I mean, I know you guys aren't shy. <laughs> so intersectionality, for those of you who may not know, started out as a concept that was developed by a woman named Kimberly Crenshaw in the late 70s. She was a law student who chronicled how uh, different forms of oppression can intersect. So for example, as a black woman, I can experience uh, forms of oppression as someone who is both black and who is a woman. And these forms of oppression can intersect in very different ways. And she wanted to come up with a term that could capture 
to capture that phenomenon. Um, so that's the origin of the term intersectionality. Uh, today in progressive spaces, it has often manifested in certain ways that are not so healthy, um, in which a sort of hierarchy of oppression um, is, is promoted in certain progressive spaces whereby if you are, you know, for example, an Ashkenazi Jew and a Zionist, you are not considered to be a part of the coalition of people who should be advocated, who should, you know, be advocated on behalf of by others. And this is a challenge that we have been dealing with, I think, since around 2014. So 2014 was when Ferguson occurred, when, when the incident with Black Lives Matter uh, sort of becoming a, a really national organization in 2014, organizing around the events in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and what we began to see was slogans that said, from Ferguson to Palestine, uh, which was the beginning insofar as I saw as the ostracization of, of Zionists from progressive spaces in a very explicit uh, political language that was disenfranchising. So I, with this question, I sort of channel a board member of mine that we all know well named Anne Lewis, and I think probably a lot of people in the audience know her, and Anne has this perfect way of describing what, intersex what intersectionality looks like in the real world that has really helped me understand it, and so, and she knows the real numbers, I'm, I'm going with the flow and the numbers, but basically the way she describes it is that if a white woman makes 90 cents on the dollar to a man, and a black woman makes 80 cents on the dollar to a a white man and a Latina woman makes 70 cents on the dollar and a Native American woman makes 60 cents on the dollar, we can't just say we want to fight for women's rights. We can't just say the, you know, the feminist movement is monolithic, you know, that there's no distinction between fighting for women, you know, for, for white women and fighting for black women or, or Native or Latina or any other group. And it's, it's I think, a, a very fair point and an interesting and important thing for us to consider as progressives who want to fight for social, racial, economic, and gender justice justice to look at the different ways that people can face oppression and marginalization. Having said that, and I think we all know this, which is why we're here, intersectionality has been weaponized and it has both uh, helped cultivate and also I think helped advance a situation where the power dynamics have really shifted and where people who are seen as having power and privilege are automatically seen as inherently evil or at least having some you know, evil inhibition. Um, and that people who have more layers of marginalization have more virtue, and this is channeling Chloe Valdery. Um, so the way that it plays out is that Jews are seen as privileged, white, powerful people, because even looking around this room, a lot of us look like white people. Um, I think, and we could get into this later, I don't see Jews as white people, and this is a whole other complicated conversation, but Jews have been persecuted throughout history for perverting the white race. And so to say just flippantly Jews are white people and they're privileged and powerful, I think leads to often very dangerous consequences. But also, Jews are not facing the same you know, forces of oppression that communities of color are facing in this country. We do have privilege. I am never going to be pulled over by a police officer for driving in a certain way. I'm not going to face police brutality. I'm not going to face express racism in public places. So it's something that our community needs to be aware of. Having said that, we have to really think about the way that intersectionality is cleaving Jews from both political spectrums. So in the radical right, if you think to the Charlottesville rally, the neo-Nazis marching through Charlottesville, they were chanting, Jews will not replace us. They didn't actually think that Jews were going to procreate at a rate to overtake white Christian society in America. What they mean when they say Jews will not replace us is that Jews have historically been and continue to be allies to communities of color, to immigrants and refugees. And so when you take that and you look at what happened in the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh, you see that a crazy white supremacist targeted a synagogue because of its relationship with Hyas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Hyas was housed in the Tree of Life. Highest is now not working with a lot of Jews because there aren't a lot of Jewish refugees uh, in the world that need resettlement, but there are a lot of Arab and Muslim refugees that need resettlement. So Highest is doing extraordinary work to find homes for people who need asylum. And so this white nationalist targeted a synagogue because of the Jewish community's relationship to immigrants and refugees. And meanwhile, when Jews are being murderously assaulted by white supremacists because of our allyship for communities of color, 
often we go into progressive spaces as Zionist Jews and we're told you are the privileged powerful people who are oppressing people of color. And so Jews feel like they then don't have a home. And what ends up happening is that we're politically disenfranchised and not welcome in the civic and social and political spaces where we've historically been, historically led, and also where we've been able to show up for and also ask for allyship. So the work of a wider bridge is intersectional because the LGBT community is intersectional. We're not only 10% of America, 10% of the Jewish community, we're also 10% of the African American community, the Latino community, Asian American community, and so on. And of course, if we're trying to build a pro-Israel voice in the LGBT movement, those leaders can't only look sound or talk like me, they have to be people of color. They have to be, people from, be part of the full fabric of LGBT life in America. And when we're engaging people of color to come on our LGBT leadership missions, and we're asking them to help us with this work, we can't only stand for them and support them at LGBT rights. We also have to support our friends within the LGBT movement with the other identities that are impacting their lives as Americans. So we weigh in on social justice issues, we weigh in, we weigh in on immigration issues, and we, we recently weighed in on the coronavirus because Asian Americans are being stigmatized right now, members of our LGBT community. So when you think about it that way, it's really quite simple. Um, we can't just compartmentalize people into separate uh, marginalized boxes. People operate with different identities and they affect them in different ways, but we have to have a holistic approach to helping people realize their full potential in this country. And the LGBT movement is a really interesting framework to be able to do some of that work. Um, here's a practical tip, okay? Intersectionality is not the problem. The problem is we as pro-Israel activists need to be at the forefront of these social justice movements. What the three of us are offering you, along with the progressive outreach work of APAC, are platforms to engage in social justice work as visible Zionists. We need to make sure that we are leading these issues and not backing away from them just because there's people we don't like within these movements. We need to care about Black Lives Matter because Black Lives Matter is important. We shouldn't walk away from it just because there's certain actors we don't like, okay? If we are seen and heard and felt in each of these movements, we will change the conversation in this country and we will all succeed at this issue that we know is so important to our future. I just wanna add one quick thing that I should have said before, which is that when intersectional spaces um, say that you know Jews are privileged white people, it's actually erasing the 20% of American Jews who are people of color. Jews of color. And that's not something that our leadership, frankly, in the Jewish community has acknowledged. It's, it's an issue that we really need to work on as a community, making sure that we are highlighting Jews of color, that we are giving them space in our community and allowing them to lead because these issues are affecting them too. And to suggest that Jews are overwhelmingly privileged and powerful is completely ignoring this 20%, again, a fifth of the American Jewish community. There was just a study that came out um, a couple of months ago. Amanda, you mentioned the white supremacy that we saw in Charlottesville, but when we talk about what I'm about to ask you, that's not the arena that you're talking about. That wasn't the impetus for Zioness, um, which is the idea that we as progressives show up in er arenas that are not always hospital to progressives who support Zionism. Can you define what, well, I think define what you mean by Zionism, because I think this is a new, a new term for some people, and then share with us why you decided to take on this challenge and why you email me work emails at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the question. Um, so it's, it, Zionist did not launch out of a reaction to the rise of white supremacy in America, but interestingly, on August 12, 2017, which is the day of the Charlottesville rally, there was another rally in Chicago the Chicago Slut Walk. And the Chicago, the Chicago Slut Walk had announced that it was endorsing the position of the Chicago Dyke March two months earlier, which had kicked out three Jewish lesbians carrying a pride flag with a Jewish star. They were told that the Jewish star was triggering people and making them feel unsafe. And one of the three was a Wider Bridge employee at the time. And this was the first time that the national press started actually paying attention to the anti-Semitism that was rising in the left because it's much easier and more obvious to call it out in the right. We can't deny it. There are neo-Nazis marching in the streets of America. Um, but it's harder, it's more, um, it's more 
it's more deeply ingrained in the left in a very different way. And it's manifesting most often as anti-Zionism. That's what anti-Semitism in the left looks like. And it's very different from anti-Semitism in the right. So when the Chicago Slut Walk said, we endorse the policy of the Dyke March, they said, we're banning Jewish stars as Zionist symbols of racism and oppression. And I said, I can't, I can't let that go. I am a progressive, I am a feminist. I am deeply concerned about rape culture and victim blaming and slut shaming and patriarchy. It's August, 2017. We are in a new political moment in this country. And as a feminist, as an American woman, there are issues that I need to take a stand on, but I'm not willing to show up and check my Jewish identity at the door. And my Zionism is inherent to my Jewish identity because Zionism is the liberation and self-determination movement of the Jewish people in our historic ancestral homeland. Zionism, thank you. Zionism is not about Bibi Netanyahu or the Likud party. Zionism is the movement of liberation for the Jewish people. And Jews can be proud Zionists in America, whether they love Israeli policy or hate Israeli policy or are ambivalent to Israeli policy or know absolutely nothing about Israeli policy. You can be a Jew who believes that a safe, secure, and sovereign Jewish state should exist in the land of Israel without telling anyone what you think about settlements. That doesn't mean you're not allowed to have a position on settlements. It doesn't mean you're not allowed to criticize the Israeli government. You can do that whenever you want, but your criticism has to be based in reality. Calling Israel an apartheid state is not criticism, it's blood libel. So we need to be drawing the lines better in the progressive space because we need to have a home there because Jews overwhelmingly identify as liberal and progressive. And if we don't have a home in the social justice spaces and the political spaces where we want to advance the domestic movements that are affecting our everyday lives, then we will be unrepresented and marginalized. So we have to fight for our right to participate in those spaces, and that takes courage. And after the Chicago Slut Walk, I went and they attacked me, not really a little bit physically but not really physically but I also had gotten 30 people in Chicago to march with us and we came up with this name Zioness and we had t-shirts and posters and a Facebook page uh, I have a friend who does PR and that's how all of this came to be uh, it happened in about three days and when we got to the slut walk the organizers had changed the whole lineup of speakers at the event to talk exclusively about the Israeli Palestinian conflict and they chased us around this park in Chicago with red umbrellas, which are the symbol of the international sex trade, and they were hitting our posters with the umbrellas and opening the umbrellas on this beautiful sunny day in Chicago to cover our logo, which is a woman, it was at that point just one woman with a Jewish star necklace. They had banned Jewish stars, so they didn't want our posters with the Jewish star necklace to appear in any of the images of the event. And after this happened, while they were chasing us and the speakers are talking about the conflict, all of these radical, very diverse, progressive feminist leaders, activists in the space were coming to us and saying, why are they chasing you around this park? Why are they hitting you? Why are they talking about foreign aid? What is a flotilla? <laughs> like, we totally don't understand. We want to talk about rape culture. Why are you here? And we had the opportunity to engage all of these people who had either heard nothing about Zionism or only the most perverse, horrible things about Zionism and say to them, Zionism is part of what it means to be a Jew for the vast majority of Jews in the world. We believe in the liberation of the Jewish people and it is a progressive value. It is, it is, an it is a, a commitment to self-determination for the world's most enduring persecuted community. And anyone who's really progressive, who really cares about equality and human dignity and justice has to know that Zionism Zionism is totally consistent with that, and for Jews, it's inextricable for us. And all of these people ended up saying to us, do you have an extra poster? We want to march with you. So, and I am so grateful. I'm so grateful that the three of you never check your ID at the uh, check your identification, check your identity at the door. Um, I hope every single person in this room walks through the world and brings their authentic self to the table, to every single table. I hope you bring your authentic self to this policy conference because it's so important that we um, stay true to who we are and who are va and our values. And Chloe, uh, you mentioned Ferguson in 2014. You mentioned the Black Lives Matter movement. We've talked about Slut Walk. Um, as an African American, a woman, a Zionist, someone who does not identify as Jewish, what do you 
like what's your additional take on all of this? How do you stand up for your values and yourselves? You talk about you talked about the theory of enchantment. Paint a picture of sure. your work for us and how so, you navigate all this. Yeah, so I, I think that if, if I could come up with any adjective uh, or one adjective to describe sort of my political orientation, I would say I'm a Kingian, which is to say that I believe in Dr. King's model of the pursuit of agape love and using the concept of agape love to navigate a lot of these very difficult uh, uh, spaces, whether that be uh, progressive spaces in which I am questioned because of my Zionism, um, or other spaces where I am challenged uh, philosophically or ideologically. And agape love teaches uh, the importance of not only you know, having a, a concern and care being for your, for your fellow human, but also care, having a care and concern for someone who is considered your enemy, whether that's philosophically, politically, et cetera. And so I try to live my life and, and live my values in the spirit of that. Uh, and how that's modeled through the theory of enchantment is as follows. The theory of enchantment uh, came out of my experience as an Israel advocate for eight years. I was a Bartley Fellow at the Wall Street Journal for a year, worked on a thesis paper on the topic of Israel advocacy and millennials, what works, what doesn't, and how to make it better. Um, and my central question initially was, how do I fight anti-Semitism? And then that became a different question, actually. Um, it, it became the question of how do I get people to actually learn how to love? And I think that I need to emphasize this, um, especially in political spaces. This is, this is APAC. We're here to sort of lobby politically. But I think that the vocabulary of love needs to be inserted back into these conversations. Um, so I changed my question from how do we fight anti-Semitism to how do we get people to learn how to love. And what I discovered was that these two things are not the same questions. They are interrelated questions, but they're not the same questions. And once I changed my focus to how do I get people how to love, I realized you know, how to do that was essentially to study what people are already in love with, especially young people. Um, and for me, the source of material that showed what people were already in love with was pop culture. So at this point in the research, I started studying pop culture and trying to see if there was a common denominator that explained why people gravitate toward the things that they gravitate toward, whether that's Nike, whether that's Beyonce, whether that's all these symbols uh, within our zeitgeist that are, that are really moving people. And I discovered that all of these influencers do ver a very simple thing. They create content where their audience sees themselves and their potential reflected in the content. That's it. And that's why we gravitate toward them as consumers. So I took that idea and I called it enchantment because there's a book uh, by Guy Kawasaki, the former marketing director of Apple, called Enchantment, where he says enchantment is the process by which you delight someone with an idea, a product, or a thing. And I took that idea and I said, okay, I'm going to enchant people with Israel and with Israeli society. But in order to do that, once I speak on college campuses, I'm going to say this is the framework that we're going to use to discuss difficult conversations, difficult topics that are debatable on college campuses. We're going to use the following three principles, and this is going to sort of guide our, our conversation. The first principle is remember that we are human beings, not political abstractions. The second principle is criticize to uplift and empower, never to tear down, never to destroy. And the third principle is, thank you, the third principle is Root everything you do in love and compassion. Again, culminating in Dr. King's vision of agape love for the rest of humanity. So we can talk about these difficult topics. We can talk about, you know, if people wanted to talk about settlements, they could talk about settlements. If people wanted to talk about uh, how they disagree with BB's policy, that was fine. But we will do it in a way that is guided by this framework so that we can disagree, but we will reintroduce compassion and empathy in the midst of profound disagreement. And so that's really how I try to live my values and how I try to navigate, like I said, these difficult spaces um, that I'm in where sometimes people don't understand the paradox of identity. People think that identity is, is, is very uh, superficial and that there isn't a depth to the human condition. And this, so this is the language that I try to use to remind people um, of that depth. And I find that it's actually very useful in navigating intersectional spaces with this kind of language because it's a reminder of King's vision of love um, and concern and care for, for other people, including for your enemies. And I think, again, we have to reintroduce that vocabulary back into the conversation.
And Ty, your focus lies at the intersection of LGBTQ rights and the U.S. Israel relationship. What do you find is some of the challenges and opportunities you face in this space, whether it's coalition building, whether it's advocacy work? So some of you know the story. In the summer of 2015 at the annual Jerusalem Pride March, uh, Shira Banki, a 15-year-old ally by her friends' accounts, was murdered when an ultra-Orthodox man stabbed six people in the middle of the march. This is very different than Tel Aviv Pride, which is a huge festive day with a quarter million people. At the time, Tel Aviv, or Jerusalem Pride had 5,000 people, and this tragedy occurred. Our job is to raise support for the LGBT community in Israel, so we launched a crowdfunding campaign to help the Jerusalem Open House, the organizers of this parade, in their greatest time of need. And one thing we did was we brought them on a speaking tour across the states. This is now in January 2016. And one obvious place that we thought to bring them was the closest equivalent to policy conference in the LGBT world called Creating Change that gets 5,000 LGBT activists each year at its annual conference. We organized a reception for Jerusalem Open House to talk about the stabbing, to make new relationships across the LGBT movement, um, and to try to have some, some healing. And instead, that reception was shut down by 250 angry protesters chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. It got rough, it got physical, kippot were thrown to the ground. And that was a wake-up call for the LGBT movement that, hey, maybe anti-Semitism isn't only something on the far right. The biggest problem we have, and this was underscored by what happened during the eight terrible nights of Hanukkah, you know, in New Jersey and New York, is that people only want to point to the other side of the aisle when it comes to anti-Semitism. And so there's this food fight going over our heads, which is tragic on both sides, where the far left wants to say this is about white supremacy, the far right saying this is about Ilhan Omar. That's not okay. But the people... The hardest thing for us to be able to do is make sure that we're addressing anti-Semitism on, on our own side of the aisle. And that's what all of us are trying to do. And it's very difficult in an intersectional coalition whose purpose is to fight different forms of hatred to admit that they have a problem with the Jews. That's a difficult conversation to have. It's a much more difficult conversation than to get the progressive movement on board in coalition to fight white nationalism. To admit you have a problem First of all, it's disruptive because you're telling them to pump the brakes on the important work that they're doing for other social justice communities. Wait a minute, stop. We have a problem in this space. That's uncomfortable. That takes a lot of courage for us as Jews and our non-Jewish allies to have that conversation to go against the grain and say, wait a minute, if we're an anti-hate coalition, we need to stand against all forms of hatred, including anti-Semitism. And over the years, what I've learned is... is Jews have a unique relationship with privilege that makes anti-Semitism unique. We are accused of having too much privilege. That's what this pinkwashing notion is all about, that somehow gay rights in Israel is just a cover-up and that we have enough power and privilege to be able to make up this grand story of LGBT life in Israel as a cover-up for terrible crimes that apparently the Israelis are doing. We need to educate our friends on the left about how privilege and power held against Jews is a unique construct that other marginalized communities in America don't face. If they don't understand who we are as Jews, they won't understand the nature of anti-Semitism. And so the work of A Wider Bridge and our partners up here is about doing that relationship building. It's about doing that core competency work to make sure that our friends understand Jewish identity. We're not just a religion, we're a people. Our peoplehood is being denied when we are denied our attachment to the state of Israel. So before we kick this to the audience, every single person in this room is an activist and an advocate or else they wouldn't be here. So what, if they forget everything else, what should they walk out the door with? Is it a tool, a question, should they write down your theory of enchantment? I mean, what should they bring back to their community? Or what should they think about? I would say, for me, I would encourage you to look into the theory of enchantment as a framework to just transform the vocabulary that is animating a lot of these intersectional spaces from a purely political one to one that is rooted in love. Again, I'm, I'm an, a big advocate for that. I'm trying to bring that uh, into the foreground. Um, and theory of enchantment provides a framework 
and a series of a, a series of sort of like workshops uh, that that can train you how to do that. I would also encourage you to get involved with Zioness. I am a board member um, of Zioness. Uh, so from a political perspective, I think it's a very very important organization that you should feel is your home as progressives and as Zionists. Uh, I agree with Chloe. <laughs> Um, I would say show up wherever you are, wherever you go with your full authentic self on full display. Don't let anyone tell you what you can be and don't let anyone tell you that you should be ashamed of any piece of yourself as a progressive and a Zionist because those two things are perfectly compatible and consistent. And when people say you can't be those things, they are, they're denying uh, who we are as Jews. They're denying our commitment to tikkun olam. They're denying, as Ty said, Jewish peoplehood. Zionism is our story. It's our history. We are the children of Zion from Mount Zion. You can't open a prayer book and not find Mount Zion on almost every page. Every synagogue in the world faces Jerusalem because of Mount Zion. So forget the politics, forget all of that stuff, and tell people why Zionism matters to you as a Jew. Go out in the world and be a Zionist, and it's hard, okay? In this room, it's super easy. We're all Zionists, I think. But <laughs> I mean, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I think. Um, but out in the world, Zionism is demonized and is perverted because we as a community have not owned it. We even told people what it is and what it means to us. And we're afraid of it now because people who hate us have taken it and turned it into something that it isn't. But if we're not there in the those spaces having the conversation and defining ourselves, other people will be there defining us. So we have an obligation, not just to fight anti-Semitism though, we have an obligation as people who care about other people, who want to be allies, who want to show up. It's a sincere thing for progressive American Jews. So don't be afraid, show up, own all of the narrative, own your full identity, and tell everybody why. First of all, we need straight allies in this fight. We can't have LGBT folks lifting up this work alone. So we would encourage you to think about how you can get involved with this struggle. But what I want to leave folks with is this. There are a lot of non-Jewish delegates who are in our space. And they are probably uncomfortable if they've never been to a pro-Israel conference before. They are choosing to show up and be uncomfortable because this is an issue that they care about. We need to be as uncomfortable and go to their spaces. We need pro-Israel folks to show up at LGBT conferences. We need, to we need to make sure that we are showing up at racial justice conferences. If they are choosing to be uncomfortable and come to us, we owe it to them and we owe it to every social justice community to commit to doing the exact same thing. So what I want you to think about is how and where can you plug in in the fight for these issues? Because if we're not in the room and our opponents are, it's obvious what's gonna happen. Thank you so much for always bringing your authentic selves. I'd like to open it up to the audience. Daniel Kamen, I'm from Chicago. Uh, you guys are great. I really liked it a lot. The question is, on the campus where I teach, Jews are very few, very small and diverse, and that means they're very assimilated. SJP, Students Justice of Palestine, is super strong and does take over all the events you spoke about if we're talking about al Sioux, every event you, that's like you said, Amanda, every event you go to, this comes up. So it's a little hard when you're in the trenches to do what you guys are talking about. I just wanted to know what kind of tools you said someone could do that with. So <laughs> Zionists, uh, I don't think I actually said we have 30, did I say we have 35 chapters around no. the country? No, sorry. We just finished another session and I didn't want to repeat things I had already said. Um, but so after the, the Chicago Slut Walk, people called us and reached out from all over the country and by the Women's March of January 2018, we had like 16 chapters and they were marching in the Women's March very proudly as Zionists. Um, and so we've been engaged in progressive activist spaces since then around the country and as of now we have 35 chapters. So first, join your chapter. We do have a Chicago chapter. Um, join your chapter, get involved, and bring other people in. Because first of all, strength in numbers is critically important. For Jews who want to be engaged in these issues, but they're afraid to show up as Zionists, if they have five friends to go with them, they'll do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did with the Chicago Slut Walk. I went with a friend, and then we invited other friends to join us. And they said, if there's a group going, I'll go. I, even I, I'm never going into an activist space where Zionism is being demonized by myself, but I'll go with others and I'll go proudly as a Zionist when I know that other people want the same thing. Beyond that, Zioness is hiring. 
Uh, we are we have a tiny actual staff, but this huge you know infrastructure around the country. And what we will be doing very soon is working to train our chapter leaders and ultimately all of our activists how to have these conversations. And we're going to be building resources and you know helping educate people to speak like we all talk, you know, so that they know how to engage in these conversations in a productive and effective way that can actually move the ball forward and that can help us reclaim our political home. What I will say is I know it's hard. I know it takes courage and I'm not trying to stand up here and be like, just go, you know, just like <laughs> throw it all to the wind and just go out in the world with like a big like Zionist, like an Israeli flag. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is show up and have the conversations that you feel you need to have. Do it, you know, respectfully, responsibly, but don't let anyone tell you what you can't be. And I, and I know it's hard. I really do. But we will help train you if you join a chapter. You should have added that come to our events and shout us down there. Well, if it's a public school, that's illegal. But that, that's a whole, I'm also a lawyer. <laughs> um, but when they shut down an event, um, that's it, it. And I know it's happening. And I'm not at all. I, I've worked on a lot of campuses. I know that it's happening. But what happens is that we are afraid to engage. And the problem is getting worse because we've been ceding the spaces to the bigots, afraid to stand up to them. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we're not showing up in the left, then we're not going to be members of it and part of it, and we can't change the trajectory of what's happening there. So I know on campuses it's like, I, I, I totally know I don't have a magic bullet for it. I wish I did. But I do know that the paradigm shifts when Jews are showing up proudly as Zionists. And I know also, and I hope that Ty can confirm, I know that people want allies that are proud of their own identities. I would imagine that nobody wants an ally who's hiding who they are, ashamed of their own community or of, of who they are as a person. Why would anybody be a good advocate or a good fighter for a marginalized community if they're part of another marginalized community and refusing to fight for themselves, right? We all know Rabbi Hillel's quote. So, um, you know, being willing to fight that fight and show up, it will get you allies that then can help you move the ball forward. The microphone in the back. We're going to popcorn. Sure. Uh, my name's Melissa, and I'm from Washington, D.C., and I work in the women's movement. Um, one question I had was about the call-out versus call-in culture. Um, and when, as a person who is a Jewish and a Zionist and a progressive Zionist, uh, you are in spaces and you want to both um, advocate for yourself and move things along, but also when you're reaching an impasse and any advice or principles slash criteria for uh, calling out versus calling in. Is there a particular incident that happened that you can describe? I'm more thinking about like the example of the Women's March sure. um, and where for a long time it was simmering and there was efforts internally and then obviously became very public and sort of at what point and what strategies you have to, to tackle that kind of thing. Do you want to talk about how, how Zioness uh, successfully got some of the women who were problematic in the Women's March sure. thrown out? <laughs> So I would say I think it's a really important question deciding whether you want to call out or call in. Does everybody know what she means by that? No. no. Okay. So what she means by that is when you see an issue and it's a public issue, uh, do you try to deal with it behind the scenes? Do you try to have a conversation, you know, try to move the ball by like building a relationship and, you know, doing it really slowly and, and you know, trying to make sure that people see each other, I think, you know, by the theory of enchantment, like with love and, and, and move the ball that way? Or do you put out a press release? Do you attack? Do you, you know, do you just say she's an anti-Semite, uh, you know, or they're anti-Semites and, you know, see if like the media will pick it up and it becomes a national issue? And I think with the Women's March, this happened that there was a strategy of saying, first, we're going to call in. We're going to have an internal conversation. I know that even before the, women, the first Women's March happened, there were conversations. There were Jewish members of the leadership committee of the Women's March who were feeling incredibly demonized. Um, there was a big article in Tablet that came out, I think, last Year, like a year, a little more than a year ago, that was really describing the anti Semitism that was not just simmering, but like festering, and that actually was really the unifying principle, like behind the Women's March leaders coming together, was their disdain for Jews. Um, and there were conversations happening, even with Jews who were part of the leadership of the Women's March who wanted to be part of it because they were like millions of women are going to march on Washington and around the world and we want to have this conversation and empower all these women to talk about reproductive justice and health care and equal pay and all this stuff. 
but it didn't change. The call in didn't work. People, it was, you know, the, the board stayed intact. And actually, the more that, you know, the Jewish community and other communities who stood in solidarity with the Jewish community on this issue of the anti-Semitism, the more they called it out, actually, the more lionized these anti-Semitic leaders became. And so it became, I think, a boiling, there was a boiling point. And at, you know, it was not until September of 2019 that actually it boiled over and three of the four original uh, anti-Semitic leaders of the Women's March were removed from the board. But, and, and Zionists played, I think, a very big role in that, but a lot of people, a lot of organizations, thank you. And it, it goes to the question of, you know, what's the takeaway? And it is to show up and be proud, even though that's hard, because we pushed the narrative out. We First of all, we confronted the narrative of anti-Zionism by showing up as Zionists. When people say, you know, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, you really can't disprove that by showing up as a Jew. You have to show up as a Zionist and be attacked as a Zionist for people to understand what anti-Zionism actually is, how it manifests, manifests what it looks like, and how it affects Jewish people. So that's the first thing. But the more we did that and the more our chapters engaged on the ground, the easier it was to say we are authentically calling out this problem, not just because we want to fight anti-Semitism, but because we want to protect the integrity of the women's movement. Um, so I think to go to your actual question, it's always a strategic question, whether you want to call out or call in. My instinct is always to call in first, but the question is going to be how long do you wait? How many tries do you give someone? How many opportunities to make it better and to apologize without meaning it? And I don't think that there's, you know, a uniform answer to that question. I think it has to be um, instinctive. But um, I would say at some point, you have to have the courage to call it out. Next question. Hi. <gasps> you okay? Sorry, I stepped on the base. Uh, I'm Ilana Goldhaber Gordon. I'm a rabbi in Redwood City, California. I uh, want to express my admiration for each of you for the work you're doing. Um, my question's a little delicate. Um, uh, I've seen the anti Semitism you're describing, two, not pr the specific examples, but the two, 250 people attacking LGBT Israeli delegation. Is, there's no way to describe that but anti Semitism. But I'm wondering, and it's a hypothetical question, but I can imagine that someone, Palestinian American, whose family had been um, forced out of their home, genuinely might feel threatened by the presence of a Jewish star. And I'm wondering if you've had those conversations, how do you navigate it? How do you understand it? Yeah. So listen, what, what lesson we can learn from the LGBT story, the most successful social justice movement of the past half century, uh, for the work that we're all doing here, is that relationships matter and that stories matter. Um, and I like to talk about Prop 8 in California that some of you were a part of, of preventing. But Prop 8, you know, after Gavin Newsom and Kamala Harris were giving out marriage licenses in San Francisco City Hall, Prop 8 passed the same night Obama was elected in 2008. Mm -hmm. Prop 8 defined marriage between a man and a woman. Um, and our friends in the marriage movement said, what, how is this possible that a deep blue state that could elect the first African American president also passed this terrible bill that defined marriage as, as only for straight people? And what they discovered was that the messaging was all wrong. We were talking about facts and figures and how many Americans were being denied the right to marry. We were giving legal statistics instead of taking it to the storytelling. And when we put people on stage and said, I have an uncle who I go visit every couple of weeks and I met his husband and they do the same Shabbat lighting of the candles every Friday night. When you hear those stories, that's what moves the needle because you realize that these folks want the same quality of life that we do. That's what we have to do in the case of Israel. We need to make sure that people are understanding our stories. And not just stories about the steroid folks under fire from the Gaza rockets, by the way, which is incredibly important, but we need to tell stories that resonate with the people that we're trying to reach. So when we're bringing folks from, from Israel to the US, we wanna tell those stories about folks who face conversion therapy, uh, gay to straight conversion therapy in the ultra-Orthodox community, because we wanna engage with activists who are fighting conversion therapy in evangelical churches across America. 
So if we can tell those stories that resonate with people, we can dramatically move the needle because as we know from the LGBT story, it's a lot harder to hate us when you know us. And the same thing is true for all of you. And I want to I want to add one thing, even though you're not here to uh, hear for hear from me, but I have the mic, so you'll have to hear it. <laughs> APAC does something called APAC Connects, where we intentionally bring people from different communities together over events like Shabbat dinner. Does anyone in here ever host a Shabbat dinner at their home? There's a lot of hands here. I strongly encourage you to invite your non-Jewish neighbors, um, community members, colleagues, uh, people from the local universities, people from the local churches, invite them to the table, invite them to your Shabbat table. Ask them to share their story with you. With a little intent, there is not a single person in the entire world that you cannot find common ground based on shared values with. And it is a beaut- it's a beautiful thing to do. So invite, invite your neighbors to your Shabbat dinner table. Yeah. So I just you have want- a mic. You can, <laughs> this is your show. We're in charge I, I, up here. I just want to say, uh, so theory of enchantment is very much interested in the psychology of the human condition. And so I think more directly to the question that was asked, Theory of Enchantment, one of the things that it teaches, and I was on a couple panels before this actually about the effect of trauma uh, in the human condition and how it affects specifically the Israeli psyche. So we teach a concept called mirror images in which you learn how the emotional uh, baggage that affects your behavior is also affecting the behavior of someone you may be in conflict with, right? So let me give you an example of that specific to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I know that when I was in school at the University of New Orleans and I was doing my pro-Israel stuff and I would see a Palestinian flag, I would feel viscerally um, disturbed by that because I knew that SJP was on that campus doing things that were anti-Semitic and so that was a very um, I had a very visceral reaction to that and so from that vantage point I can understand how if someone has had a negative experience from someone wearing a Star of David that they may associate that experience with the Star of David. Now that's a problem and my Zionism is big enough and large enough to acknowledge that but then say now how can we work on this from a psychological perspective to unpack that to transform that and not stay in that state. So we can acknowledge that, but there are tools that we can put into place to learn about each other and learn about how connected we are so that we can transcend that visceral reaction that we have when we see those symbols. Next question. Hello, my name is Aaron from Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, There seem to be a lot of Jews, left-wing Jews, joining what I think are progressive anti-Semitic organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace and, and other ones that I won't mention right now, and are essentially using their Jewish heritage as a shield against legitimate charges of anti-Semitism happening within those organizations and those progressive organizations. So I guess really my, my question would be, what is your strategy, what would be a good strategy, you think, for dealing with those people that are of Jewish heritage? Um, including major presidential candidates, um, and are using that status to shield what, what I, I think are blatant anti-Semitic organizations that purport to be Jewish but really are not. So, is it okay? I think the strategy is Zionists, uh, which may <laughs> shock people. There are fringe elements of the Jewish community, such as JVP, and there are other groups who claim to speak on behalf of American Jews as anti-Zionist, and they simply don't. They simply don't. It's a fact that they don't. JVP puts out a report every year, and their 2019 report said they had 14,000 members. Now, we know that they're inflating those numbers, obviously, and we also know that a lot of the people that associate with JVP are not Jewish. But let's take their 14,000. They represent 0.02% of the American Jewish community. They have an outsized voice because they show up everywhere and they scream and shout and make a ruckus and people feel like they have to respond because they're showing up as Jews and because the Jewish community has not responded by unifying the very vast majority of us who are actually progressive and actually Zionist. 
when we are all speaking together, when we're coming together in a sort of big tent of the progressive Jewish left, who is also deeply committed to Zionism because it is consistent with our progressive values and our progressive identity, we can silence those people. We can tell civic and social and political leaders that those groups do not speak for American Jews. We can marginalize them just so easily and so quickly if we come together and allow someone who actually makes sense, an organization that actually makes sense, and I think all of our organizations make sense, but come into a space, into an umbrella, and let that organization speak for you because when you find an ideological home, you wanna be counted. The strength of Zion S is to say we have 35 chapters, we have thousands of members, we have powerful national board, we have an extraordinary staff, we have leaders who are speaking on behalf of people who have been feeling voiceless and homeless for so long. And then when the Zion S leadership goes out into the world and says all of these Jews who are feeling homeless, who are silenced by the people who claim to represent us who don't, now we have a home, please listen to Zion S. That's what makes sense for us, that's what can speak on our behalf. You know, go online and share our statements hashtag Zion S speaks for me that's our job it's to say American Jews are Zionists and anyone who says otherwise doesn't speak for us but we need the numbers and we need you behind us and we need you to share our social media posts and we need you to tell your friends to say I am a Zionist and I'm not gonna let anyone else speak for me so listen <laughs> young people in this country feel like the institutions that worked for their parents and grandparents don't work for them with crippling debt, with a climate emergency, they are upset. And if you look at the voting patterns in the primary, it shouldn't be surprising because they feel like the democratic institutions that were set up for success are no longer working. So they're turning to alternatives. And that lens is which they're viewing the established Jewish community, okay? And the reality is we have to ask the question, how are young people going to define their relationship with Israel? They're going to want to define it in the same way they define their country. We need to make institutions work for us again. And these groups that shall not be named are trying to define the future of the... Yeah, Voldemort. We, they're trying to define the relationship with Israel based on what they perceive as Israeli war crimes. We need to make sure that we're giving young people a pro-Israel platform to make Israel a better place. And that's what the work of a wider bridge is all about. We're not only advocating for Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, we're making it better. We're strengthening Israel's democracy by standing up for LGBTQ rights in Israel and LGBT marginalized, sorry, and Israeli marginalized communities. Because a stronger democracy is more likely to care about the other, and that includes the Palestinians. There is a pro-Israel way to do work inside of Israel. That's not APAC's mandate, but young and excited people wanna make America better, and young and excited American Jews wanna make Israel better, and we need to give them pro-Israel avenues to be able to do that. Well, I identify as progressive and activist. There are many people who agree with every word that's been said here, but for a variety of reasons, don't identify as progressive or activist because of things that have gone on. How can we get these people involved uh, who have turned away to come back and support uh, progressive activism as Zionists? Um, people who are progressive but don't feel comfortable Id identifying as progressive because some of the things that have been happening. I think the entire, one of the purposes of Zionists is to empower people to actually reclaim the, the term progressive um, by saying that Zionism is the progressive uh, movement to stand with and to stand by. So my question is, uh, as a pro uh, progressive Zionist on campus, how do you think progressive Zionist students should reach out to the communities in their universities who won't actually listen to us and don't want to create relationships with Zionists because of all like the negative rhetoric? I would suggest like a drip drip method. So even if you are finding yourself uh, seeing like a big protest of uh, Israel, and you think that the people in that cohort are not reachable, I would say reach out to them individually um, and ask them if you can have coffee with them or break bread with them in some way. And that's not, it's not a guarantee, obviously, that they're going to say yes, but always make it clear that the invitation is always open and try to have some type of relationship with them, whether it's the president of that organization or if it's like a lay leader in that organization. Always sort of like chip away at the, at the relationship building, even though on an official level, there's this animosity. My question has to do with the fact that for me I see intersectionality as something that also includes socioeconomic class and while we're all so lucky to be here today it's not exactly accessible to so many people to have this type of conversation so how do we make this conversation more accessible to other types of people? 
Um, I think a lot about this. I don't know if you guys have different answers uh, to this to this particular question. I think that we actually need to expand um, the language and the and the content of of what we're talking about when we're talking about inequality. Um, yes, we need to talk about sort of the material conditions that affect people and that that uh, keep people from having access to spaces like this. Um, but we also need to talk about. Uh, the inequity in terms of the spiritual conditions that keep people from spaces like this, and that's sort of where the psychological piece comes into play. So I think that Zion Ness actually has a lot of initiatives um, with regard to the socioeconomic piece and expanding the conversation. Um, but I think, again, the spiritual slash psychological conversation needs to be a part of it because you can't be a critic of of hyper consumerism and hyper capitalism if the vocabulary that you're using is explicitly capitalist that's a fundamental contradiction and i think that that goes on uh pervasively in intersectional spaces ironically my question is so as like i and other high school seniors go to college what are like the biggest changes that happen like when you see you're talking about anti-semitism and i guess like also also intersectionality from high school to college and like what's your biggest advice from that um, in terms of the high school to college transition, what I've experienced in speaking to high school students is that, and this varies from place to place, this is not generalized, the anti-Israel animus is not necessarily overt in high school. There is like the intersectional um, uh, vocabulary that is sort of being um, disseminated to students, which is a good thing, but it's usually what I've seen, it's usually related to uh, strictly domestic issues, um, racial justice, socioeconomic justice, etc. That will change once you get into the university or that may change, especially when you're talking about top tier schools in this country where the intersectional framework is explicitly used to discuss one foreign policy issue, namely the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So you will have to be able to develop a, a robust vocabulary to be able to respond to that. And I think that we've been discussing some of the tips and tools to be able to address that uh, in, a, in an efficient and, and uh, productive way. And uh, quickly to close, I would just say people can smell inauthenticity, okay? When we're trying to build relationships, it can't be a quid pro quo, which is everyone's new word. It has to be a long-standing relationship built on mutual trust and admiration. And so for the campus space in particular, Hillel houses and pro-Israel campus groups need to start by just doing the right thing. And that doesn't just mean putting a decal of a rainbow sticker. It means volunteering, it means raising money for LGBT causes, a wider bridge can help with these things, and so can Zion S. We need to make sure that we're demonstrating authenticity and showing up with our values. Not because we expect their support, but because it's the right thing to do. And after time, even if the organized community won't work with you at first, you will be recognized for that authenticity and the relationships will follow. So my best advice, do the right thing. Thank you so much for coming. I just want to leave you with one thing. We've heard a lot about relationships here and that relationships matter. And my favorite quote is, life moves at the speed of relationships. People are either walls, doors, or bridges. And I really encourage you to be the bridge. Oh, I love Thank that. you. I love that. Let's take a quick break. I have to go. I have a meeting. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.